Um, so to follow up on a theme of an emerging uh, zoonosis, we now have Dr. Dimitri Daskalakis, who is the uh, Deputy Director of the MPOX National Response at the White House, and he previously had major leadership roles at the Centers for Disease Control. He's internationally known um, for his leadership role in treatment of HIV. He's an infectious disease expert. He's focused much of his career on the treatment and prevention of HIV and STIs, and he's an activist physician with a focus on LGBTQ communities. Um, he really is uh, the person we think of when we when we think about MPOX, and we just went through that uh, terrible scenario. And, you know, we are talking about pediatrics, and this is a, is a disease that affects children remarkably, particularly in Africa. So thank you so much for joining us remotely, and you can take it away. Thank you very much. I'm really excited to be here, and I'm sorry for any of the delay for technical issues, but I think that um, we have slides and we have voice, so we're good to go. So, um, so thanks again for the lovely introduction. I will really be focusing a lot on the domestic experience with MPOX. I'm going to start by talking about MPOX and how it's joined the syndemic of HIV, STI, and other um, very critical um, social determinants of health. After that, we will then move into talking about where we are in terms of cases, surveillance, vaccination, treatment, a little bit on research, um, engagement, equity, and then I'm going to end with a reminder about the work that we still need to do in spring, summer uh, 2023 so that we can maintain excellent control. And um, as you can see, I have no conflicts of interest or disclosures. Next slide, please. So we'll start with a conversation about MPOX and the syndemic. Next slide. And um, what a syndemic is, they are interacting epidemics that interact with each other, and by that interaction, increase their adverse effects on the health of communities that face systematic, structural, and other inequities. So I'm going to give you the story of how MPOX entered the syndemic. So um, we learned early on, and I'm going to show you some of the stories and some of the narrative around this, that MPOX interacted with HIV and STI, but that it also interacts with other elements of uh, and other challenges to people's health. So the, some of those are biological, some are, the, are because the populations are very similar, but ultimately, next click please. What happens is that with social determinants of health, such as systemic racism, homophobia, transphobia, and housing instability or unavailability, next click please, what happens is that these interacting epidemics become galvanized as a way more potent force to impact the community. Next slide, next click please. So this all together, the interaction of these infections, along with the uh, social determinants and environment in which these infections interact, make them a lot stronger in terms of their effect on the community. Next slide, please. The first glimmer of information around this happened in September 2022. We did a match of uh, nine jurisdictions between their HIV STI registries and their registry of MPOX. What we found was that 38% of individuals with an MPOX diagnosis also had HIV. 41% had had an STI or a sexually transmitted infection in the year prior, and all comers, 61% had either or. Next slide, please. When you look deeper into that data, it was not only about concurrence of disease, but also severity. People with MPOX and HIV were more likely to report severe symptoms. Next more likely to be hospitalized, next and next. And the, uh, the more out of control their HIV infection was, the more likely they were to have more severe outcomes, specifically looking at hospitalization. Low T cell counts and high viral load were, were associated with worse outcomes. Next slide, please. The next information that really supports the entry of MPOX into this pandemic was data released on the 57 people hospitalized in the United States that the CDC had heard about. So this, in effect, is a case series of folks who were hospitalized. In this case series, 82% um, were living with HIV. They had CD4 count, three quarters of them at least, of less than 50. That's their T cell count, not their viral load. Only about 10% of them were on HIV medications, click please. And as billed in this pandemic, systemic racism and other factors like housing instability seem to map to the severity of this illness. Next slide, please. An international case series subsequently was released 
that really back up at least the biological interaction between HIV and MPOX, with severe complications being way more common uh, among uh, individuals with lower T cells. In fact, um, all of the deaths that were reported in this case series happened in individuals who had T cells that were less than 200, and higher viral loads were also associated with worse outcomes. But HIV viral loads. Next slide, please. A couple of weeks ago, CDC also released data on the 38 deaths that have been reported so far in the United States that are, have been attributed to MPOX in an MMWR. Click, please. What was learned in this uh, study was that um, almost all of the folks who passed away were black, 87%, mapping very closely to what we saw with the hospitalizations. Most were cisgender men, which really correlates with who we were seeing these infections in in the U.S. And among individuals that had data, the 24 decedents with HIV, um, most had T cells less than 50. In fact, only one had T cells over 50, and uh, that individual's T cells were less than 200. Next click, please. The median age of, uh, of decedents was 34, but there were folks as young as 22 who passed away. Click, please. Um, also, there was a geographic propensity to the South, so about almost 50% of these uh, deaths occurred in people who resided in the South. And again, five of the 11 for whom we had data around ho housing um, were actually not housed. Next slide, please. Um, I added a slide, but it, it's not in this deck. Um, uh, uh, LA County just released data as well in, among their cases of MPOX in homeless individuals. This continues to play out. 60% of the homeless people who um, had MPOX were living with HIV, and around 50% of them were virally unsuppressed. So the story continues. 21% of those individuals were subsequently hospitalized with severe disease. So systemic challenges require systemic solutions. Click, please. And early on in the outbreak, we actually worked with multiple pieces of government to roll out systemic strategy to address this outbreak. HRSA, through Ryan White, created flexibilities in their Ryan White funding so that funds and human resources could be used to address MPOX. CDC followed looking at HIV resources, as well as sexually transmitted infection resources in the prevention space that could also be used to address MPOX. But again, it's not all about infectious diseases, and certainly that's not been the story in the United States. SAMHSA created flexibilities in their drug user health portfolio, as well as their, in their mental health portfolio, um, to really allow the use of resources for MPOX. And then HUD, the housing authority, including HOPWA, which is a piece of HUD that deals with uh, people living with HIV, created some very historic flexibilities so that housing resources could be extended to individuals affected by MPOX to improve outcomes and disease. Next slide, please. That leads us to where we are on MPOX. And I have more information that's newer than what I'm showing um, on the actual slide, so I will fill in what the new news is. Next slide, please. So we are uh, still around 30,360 cases now in the United States. These data were just updated last night. Um, we are up to 42 deaths, so that's four additional deaths since the uh, publication of CDC's MMWR. Next slide, please. The update here is um, that um, just yesterday, this was updated, and we've had our first week in the United States of zero reported infections of MPOX. So though we still see, um, again, for the weeks before this, we've seen uh, a case on average a day, we've hit one milestone, which is that we have seven straight zeros. We are not out of the woods, but this is a really good piece of news in terms of uh, following this outbreak and this very, very exciting epi curve. Click, please. Um, we also have surveillance data that's in wastewater. So this was also updated yesterday. And what we're seeing is that uh, looking at wastewater, we're only seeing um, two sites with detection, one with consistent detection in Virginia and another with intermittent detection in Dallas. So um, we do see intermittent detection here and there um, over the weeks that we've been following and posting this publicly. But again, um, this appears to be um, only a very small number of sites. Um, that are identifying MPOX virus in their wastewater. Click, please. 
looking at the cases um, and age distribution, um, the majority of cases are happening in cisgender men, 95%. Cisgender women make up about 3% of cases, trans men, 0.2%, trans women, 0.9%, and folks with other gender identities, 0.8%. You can see that um, the, the belly of this outbreak is around 31 to 35, but there are um, cases on either side, and we're going to talk about the younger folks in a moment. Click, please. Also important to note that there's a pretty significant disparity that we see in cases with the majority of them, 60% um, being among black and Latino individuals. And this is an important number to remember because we're gonna talk about where we're seeing vaccines happening and in which populations we are under um, we are underperforming in terms of, of, of getting vaccine to the community in an appropriate uh, ratio to the burden of disease um, that they experience. Click please. Um, Earlier in the outbreak, uh, the CDC released a uh, MMWR that focused on the uh, cases of MPOX that occurred in children and adolescents aged eight, less than 18 in the United States. Next click, please. And um, there were really two different stories. Um, among 28 children who were aged zero to 12, um, and almost all 64% were assigned male at birth, skin-to-skin -skin contact with an adult with MPOX who was caring for the child was the mo most common way that MPOX was transmitted. When we hit adolescents in that 13 to 17 year old range, again, now the higher proportion were male, male to male sexual contact became the most common presumed exposure route. Again, reminding us the importance of, uh, of uh, sexual health in adolescents, um, especially LGBTQ adolescents as well. Um, there were 89% uh, were not hospitalized, none received ICU care, and there were no mortalities. Click please. The disparities were also seen um, from the race and ethnicity perspective in this population with well over 70% of individuals um, in this group being black or Latino. Next slide, please. So we're gonna talk a bit about vaccination. Click please. Um, to date, we've administered about 1.2 million doses of vaccine in the US. This curve represents first and second doses over time. Um, we would like to see that curve go up. So even though it seems to be approximating the case curve, that's not what we'd like to see. We really want to do have a prevention stance and increase vaccination so that we can be protected against future outbreak. And we're going to cover that in a moment. Click, please. One more click. The CDC recently released data that actually created a vaccine to need ratio in effect between um, uh, looking at different races and ethnicities. What they found was that for every one case in a white individual, 43 white folks were vaccinated. For every one case in a Hispanic or Latinx individual, 17 Hispanic or Latinx individuals were vaccinated. For every one case in a black individual, nine black individuals were vaccinated. This really highlights the disparity that we see in vaccine and actually mirrors very closely what we see in HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis. This looks very similar to the HIV prep to need ratio that we talk about frequently as an indicator of equity related to burden of disease. Next slide, please. I also wanted to focus on age. So we do have uh, data on, in, on some younger individuals who have received vaccination. You can see the box I have around some numbers. It's, a, it's not a very large number of folks from the, in the zero to 17 range who've gotten vaccine, but there are a good number of 18 to 27 year olds who have. Um, the FDA emergency use authorization for administration of the vaccine actually allowed for or authorized administration of this vaccine to uh, individuals less than 18 year old, years old. We also do have some specific safety data before the EUA when this was under an expanded access IND that showed that this vaccine was safe and well tolerated in young individuals. Click please. And again, this is another way of showing very similar data that, um, that the, the proportion of cases that are in black and Latino individuals, that's the light blue and the yellow, don't match what we're seeing in terms of vaccination. So it's another way of sort of, of expressing that vaccine to need ratio. Click please. Treatment, next slide. 
So um, almost 7,000 courses of, of TPOX have been administered. Again, this mirrors very closely the demographics of individuals with the infection. Here, the, the um, race ethnicity disparity is not as pronounced. So Black and Latino individuals um, are cl closer to mirroring their, um, their experience with disease and the disease burden. Uh, as you can see, there are children um, in the zero to five range who received the drug. And again, at least through the EAIND, there's not been any, any uh, safety signal. Next click. Um, and I wanted briefly to talk about some of the exciting things that happened in the research space in MPOX and are still ongoing. We conducted a very, um, a, a new format, a research gathering where we actually uh, presented all of the US government work available on videos still online in vaccine, in treatment, in diagnostics. And though it's not research, it's research adjacent surveillance. Um, these were presented as recorded videos. We had 800 folks who attended the conference um, virtually and had some great conversations about where we see gaps. One of the ways that we think it's important to identify gaps is to have a high level of transparency with the work that's actually getting done. At the same time, we released an update of our US government monkeypox research summary. It is available online on the HHS website um, for MPOX response, and it actually lists all of the US government funded work that is happening in the MPOX space. Click please. And there, there's two studies I wanted to highlight. One, the STOP trial, which continues to be uh, to recruit in the United States um, with the goal of actually learning whether TPOX actually has effectiveness in treating MPOX. It's approved under the animal rule um, and it's approved for smallpox with an EAIND for use in MPOX. So this is an opportunity to actually um, learn not only about the safety, but some of the virology as well as the effectiveness of this drug. It is still recruiting and available um, for, to pregnant women and people of all ages. So please uh, note this number in, in the scenario that you may have someone who could qualify for this study. Click please. There is also a study happening on, on uh, do delivery of vaccine, intradermal versus subcutaneous at various doses. From the perspective of people who, um, uh, who think about children, the, uh, there is going to be like an, another arm of this study that is going to look at younger people and vaccines. So to date, it's focused on over 18 year olds. So watch this space, there's more coming um, on this study. And for those of you who participated, thank you. Next slide, please. Um, and I'm going to go through these quickly. One of the key features of this response was really engaging with the community. Click, please. So through over 600 White House engagements, we worked very closely with the Assistant Secretary of Health and her team. Um, we really created a lot of outreach and connectivity between this response and the community. Click, please. This included going to the field and doing some vaccination efforts um, around the country. And so you'll see some examples of those. And many of them resulted in, in very good uptake among people who were historically not represented adequately in numbers of vaccines. Click, please. Yeah, we also, through those interactions, created crowdsourced videos that are accessible and allow people to learn about vaccine as well as MPOX. So if you, uh, we, they're definitely worth taking a look. They're on HIV.gov actually. And they don't, they, don't, they don't focus just on people who are living with HIV, but have really good information. And the questions literally came from the people that we met in the community. Next slide, please. And this gets me to the end. So we need to finish the job. And let me tell you what I mean by the job. Next slide, please. There's modeling data from the CDC that asks the question, how high do we need to go to protect uh, communities at risk from MPOX. What they found was that there's a linear and inversely linear relationship between vaccination rate and or immunity and the risk for an outbreak. The more people who are immune by vaccine ideally, but also by natural infection, the less likely we are to have an outbreak. There, however, was a threshold. Individual populations or jurisdictions with a uh, rate of less than 35% of those at risk vaccinated are at risk for actually having outbreaks equal to or larger than the one that we had last year. So we have some pretty clear calls to action that we are not done vaccinating. Next slide, please. Along with this modeling data, CDC released a good view into the, into the story of vaccination across the U.S. 
we have broken the 35% barrier for single doses, but we are under 25% for full vaccination, which means two doses. So we are at risk for uh, another outbreak and an outbreak that could be larger, even though we do have some good news today of seven zeros in a row. We're not resting on those laurels. Click, please. We also um, really wanted to put MPOX within the context of the syndemic. And so recently, the CDC released a website that focuses on getting healthy and ready for summer 2023 with focus on LGBTQ individuals. Um, click, please. This is not just about MPOX. It's about traveler's health. It's about sexual health, including HIV, STI, MPOX, Shigella, meningococcal disease, all of the threats. Um, that are really challenging the community, mainly of, of LGBTQ folks. We have a section on COVID vaccines because COVID vaccines are super important. And in a non-infectious disease um, uh, component, we have a lot of information about how to stop overdose, given that sometimes summer fun could mean being close to people who are using drugs or using drugs yourself. Click, please. With that, and with all those technical difficulties, we've made it through the slides. And I think that there is a little bit of time um, for some questions and answers. So I'm sorry that it took me a while to get on. It was all sorts of, of trouble and probably all my fault. Oh. No, it's no, thank you so much for your presentation. I mean, this is one of the most recent examples of what we were talking about in the prior um, session about how these things emerge and how it directly impacts um, adults and children. Um, is there any questions in the audience before I ask a question? Yes, Dr. Teach. How long is that, how long is vaccination? Uh, the question was, um, how long does immunity last from the vaccination and second part? Will this be a recurring issue or do we think we'll stamp it out once and for all? These are all the million dollar questions. So, th so thank you for asking them. So we, we don't know how long uh, immunity will last from the vaccine and we may not really know how long immunity is going to last from natural infection. Um, to date, there've only been five reports um, of individuals who have had natural infection, who have had recurrent infection. So if it is possible, it's not happening very frequently. Studies are happening now. Um, we have this great opportunity because MPOX we had a real live MPOX challenge um, and we were able to see how the vaccine functions. So vaccine effectiveness data will continue to roll out as we go forward. And there are several studies domestically and internationally looking at correlates of immunity, looking like specifically at neutralizing antibody, et cetera, to see um, if we can gauge duration of, of, uh, of at least the durability of those antibodies even if we can't necessarily say if that means protection prospectively um, against a real viral challenge. Um, there's, this may be a problem going forward. Our goal, which is our uh, aspirational goal, is, is domestic elimination. So we don't want to have domestic transmission. But I think as long as we have susceptible populations, there's risk. I think that as we go forward, keep your eye on the ACIP as they potentially in the future will discuss whether or not there is a future indication for ongoing vaccination even outside of outbreak. Right now, they've recommended outbreak vaccine. And so we are still in that in the mix of that. And so that's what we're, we're, we're working under. But that may change based on what we see with this uh, outbreak. Thank you for that question. I have just one other question. You know, when we, we actually had several cases at Children's, some in adolescents in conjunction with uh, co-infections, but some in very small toddlers who basically through contact uh, got this. And we were really scared because of the prior reports of the severity of this in children and the high mortality. Do you have any idea like why this particular outbreak was less, uh, you know, less mortality, less severity, particularly in kids? I have had some of the most lovely conversations with folks who are world experts in MPOX asking that same question, like what was the, what's the magic of this one that is, you know, number one, this clade is less severe than, than clade one, no real answer to that. And also like, why is it not as severe in children as we expected? And, and I've, I've heard everything from, we don't understand the biology to like the story is different outside of the US in terms of susceptibility to infection. But I don't think we have an answer to that. And that could be a very important piece um, of research in the future. Okay, thank you so much.